Hello Year 12, this is going to be a short screencast looking at a couple of the spreads that we've discussed in class um, and just adding some additional observations that I've gathered from discussions with other students and other teachers. So the first one we were looking at, and this is from page, I think it's 15 in your version, and a couple of the points that I discussed with Mrs Hando was what I wanted to bring up here. And the first one was this language here. I was at that time young and really a nice handsome boy. Now in my class we noted that this was broken English and it was very um, easy to note that that was the narration. The present day narrator, Vladek, telling his story. And what um, Miss Hando extended on that is she gives it, she said it gives it a sense of authenticity. The use of broken English in the narration illustrates a level of truthfulness in arts recreation, which is this book, because this is a verbatim or word for word uh, replication of what he, of what Vladak said, his own words. It is therefore, if it's someone's own words straight from the horse's mouth as such, it is called primary source information because that is someone who observed it themselves. They are a primary source. Um, that uh, therefore um, makes the story more authentic and realistic for the reader and easier to understand. Uh, this also, as I noted before, makes it easier to distinguish between the different narratives and my, readers might then go on and infer from the tone that Vladek uses in this section. Um, they might infer things about what kind of person he is, his confidence, whether you think he's a bit of a womanizer or um, he is a bit arrogant or he's a bit of a social climber. It depends how you want to interpret him uh, based on those uh, word bubbles, speech bubbles. Um, and you might make an observation about how this would make Artie feel. What Vladek's saying, what is, it, what is Artie like, how is Artie likely to react to that? Then we also had a conversation about memory um, and the idea that memory isn't this comprehensive moment by moment look at everything you ever did. We are very selective about what we remember and possibly we choose to remember certain things because um, we don't mind remembering those and we block other things because we need to protect ourselves and um, and help ourselves to cope maybe in in the future when in the past we've had a very um, awful or traumatic experience for example Vladex experience in the concentration camp so whilst this is uh, one moment it's not as if uh, Vladek has remembered every single thing that ever happened he's choosing particular points in time to talk about and he is in a way editing the memories that he is giving to his son Artie and possibly as I said it's a coping mechanism for him to survive shielding himself from some of his own memories and experiences um, but that's up to you how you want to talk about it in the way that what he's telling him is a kind of maybe a sanitized version of what happened it might not be the true horrors of what happened but also interesting in terms of um, back here we made a point or I made a point about um, inferring from the tone. You might also make an inference about the fact that Vladek has interrupted the story that he's telling to tell um, Artie who he looked like and give him an example. So what do you think that says about Vladek? You, we've also got, and we talked about this in class, I'm only going to briefly touch on it, but the fact that the old and frail man is overlaid against the strong and powerful shake in the background, which is who he is, um, who he thinks he resembled in his former life before the Holocaust and before it kind of took the toll that it did on him and his body and his mind. Um, finally, this was a very good observation made by um, a student in Mrs. Hando's class. And these are the kind of mini observations that you need to be making because these are the things that stand out from the crowd. Examiners don't want to hear all the same things over and over again. They want to see a spark, something different, something that you might have noticed. And that's about trying to read for meaning all the time in all the pictures and words. 
but there was a suggestion that this um, wheel here kind of looks like a film roll, as if Vladek is projecting his story again, an edited version of his story, because a film has been edited. It's not all the raw footage, not everything that ever happened. It's just the moments that the editor and the director would like you to see. So um, that is something you might want to think about, and again, it suggests an editing process. There was also some commentary about um, the black circle behind here as if that's foreshadowing the kind of dark depths of Vladek and Anya's future relationship or possibly Vladek and Lucia spelt the end of it that he didn't really want to commit. But you could have a little think about that um, and see where you go with it. The other spread that we looked at was this one, which you were going to do at home. So I've made just a couple of very brief notes on that. So we know that when a panel doesn't have a border, that's significant. And this we would see as a transition. They're moving in memory from, I think on the past page, it was a present narrative. And now we're moving back into the historical narrative, which is Vladek's story. We have that transition through the train moving through the screen. Now, here we have two different perspectives. First, we're looking into the train and seeing the reaction of the Jewish passengers. And then we are looking um, out of the train from their perspective to see what it is that's given them this reaction. The first thing that I noted, and I know a couple of students have mentioned it to me, is the eyes. More often than not, and I'm talking in sort of 80 to 90% of the case, they are drawn like this as dots. But there are rare moments where the full eye is drawn and this is a far more expressive look at the human face. Even though they're mice, we know they're humans because their humanity is brought through in this emotional reaction to whatever's going outside, going on outside the train. And then we switch perspective and again we're back to the dots but we are able to see what they are looking. And this is the first moment that they see the swastika um, symbol on a flag um, being flown uh, during their during their lifetime um, as a kind of symbol for the Nazi party. Now this is while Vladek and Anya are on their way to the sanatorium and after this it switches to the sanatorium and that's where we focus on for quite a few pages and the experience of life life there for Vladek and Anya and how beautiful it was and how lovely, which is quite interesting because it's as if he just hinted at this kind of horror and, and all the um, emotions and ideas attached to this, all that are connotations of this symbol, the swastika. He hinted at them and then he shut it off and he's moved into some a memory that he likes a bit more, which is that of the sanatorium with Anya, kind of their golden days, you would say, as she comes back out of her shell and her depression um, sort of seems to calm a bit and she becomes a happier individual. Um, but this symbol then dominates the text. It becomes omnipresent, which means always present. It permeates their lives from this day forward. And whilst he chooses not to focus on incoming pages, and the effect that this symbol and the people and ideas associated with it, the effect they're having on his lifestyle and the lifestyle of Jewish people and their livelihoods, um, it's still going on in the background. And it will come to be, um, we'll see it shortly with um, some cats and pigs. I think they show it in a few pages time. Um, but again, this is a symbol and it is foreshadowing what is to come. And there are many ideas about what, what it's foreshadowing and I've said here fear persecution edicts which is laws that govern the Jews and what they could and couldn't do then they moved into the ghettos the camps and for many of them death obviously this could be switched around depending on the person but that's my kind of general line of thinking the last thing that I wanted or there's two more things I wanted to touch on but the first is reader reaction so when you're looking at the swastika you will have one reaction with the knowledge of hindsight you know what that symbolises and what that means and it means all these things for you. At this point, the protagonists don't know exactly that this is what is to come. They do have a sense of fear, though, which is evident in their eyes and a bit of panic and worry. 
So you need to think about how that affects how the reader reacts to the text and then maybe how they feel about the protagonist, the characters here, um, given their reaction to the symbol. Finally, the size of this panel alone, look how large it is, dominates the page. That is indicative of a crisis point or pivotal moment in the text and that's how you would talk about it. You would say, in chapter three, um, the pivotal moment in which the protagonists first see the swastika flag flying um, on their train journey to the sanatorium suggests that or is symbolic of da 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 and then you'd go on and talk about it but when you're writing remember you're not saying on page 34 in the large panel that's a really awkward way to talk about the images in the text instead you might say in chapter two when or when art uh, is or when vladek sorry is traveling to the sanatorium with anya he notices da, da, da. just situate it within the story rather than being so specific in terms of page and panel you would only use um, panel as a word if you were talking about maybe the size or the lack of a border or things like that all right I'm going to leave that to you if you're in my class there are some sentence starters on the slides for this week so make sure you check those out and you, they can help you to write your teal analysis for this spread and the other spread all right signing off good luck